Praise the Lord. Peace and greetings to you all once again in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Clinton. To those of you who are in Christ Jesus, you know me, of course, as Brother Clinton. And this is the Word Prophet Channel, a Christian ministry dedicated to the purpose of teaching the Word of God to the people in the churches of God so that we can go back to serving God in spirit and in truth as our Lord Jesus Christ commanded. In English, the Word of God is preserved for us in this book, the Holy Bible, King James Version. If you have yours, and I hope that you do, please open up with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4. I'd like to share with you something very important. And the reason that I say that in English, the Word of God is preserved for us in this book, the Holy Bible, King James Version, is because it's very, very important to know what the Word of God says. Because it's written in the Scripture, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. And you see, the only way that a man of God can be perfect is to be able to know what God's Word says, so that he can do that which God commands us to do, and abstain from that which God commands us to abstain from, so that he can learn the wisdom that cometh from above, so that he can know what God's Word says. And the only way that we can know what God's Word says is to get revelation from him, as far as which Bible is his word, and he will give that. He is the living God. Praise the Lord. So in English, there are many different Bibles. They all have Holy Bible stamped on the front cover, but many of them are not holy on the inside. And the truth of the matter is that it's not possible for any two Bibles in the same language that say two different things to both be God's word. Because if they say two different things, how are they then profitable for correction or doctrine? or reproof, or instruction in righteousness. You see, a man of God can't be perfect if he doesn't know what God's Word says. And so in English, for a little over 400 years, we have had the Word of God preserved for us in the Holy Bible, King James Version. Other English Bibles that are worded differently and don't say the same thing are not God's Word. They're copyrighted novels. A novel is a story that is written by a man or a woman. And in this particular case, these books have been changed so significantly from the Word of God that they were able to obtain a copyright. Now, the only way that you can obtain a copyright is if that which you are presenting to the copyright or patent office is, is considered to be an original work. So these authors of these false New Age Bibles, as I call them, had to so significantly change the Bible to their own books, to, to create their own books, novels, that they were considered to be an original work. You see, that's how different they are from the Word of God. And if you will read the Holy Bible, King James Version, and compare it to other Bibles that are written today in English, you'll see exactly what I'm telling you, if you're one of Jesus' sheep, that is. So praise the Lord. Now that I've spoken that, let's open our Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 4, and I want to talk to you about something very important. 1 Timothy chapter 4, in the last verse, verse 16, and may God bless the reading of his word. Paul wrote to Timothy, and he said, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. You see, my friends and my brethren, there is a doctrine that is spoken of all throughout the word of God. It is called the doctrine of Christ. It's also called the doctrine of God. It's also called the Apostles' Doctrine. All these three names or titles are given to this specific doctrine in the Bible. It is the doctrine that we find throughout the scriptures, from Genesis to the Revelation, that tells us who God is, who His Son is, how He created everything, how God created everything that is, how it is that men can be saved, what's inside of us, how it is that we can grow in God's grace and learn to be disciples of Jesus Christ. This is why Jesus said, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus did not tell anybody to go to church, and he also did not tell anybody to go to seminary. You see, God never, ever, ever sent anybody to a seminary. Never. There has never been a time in history when God ever sent anybody to a seminary to learn about divinity or to learn how to be a pastor or an apostle or a prophet or to learn how to be anything. 
in the church of Jesus Christ. You see, men and women that go to seminary are men and women that don't know God, and they don't want to seek God. They don't want to do that which God commanded us to do, which is to continue in his word and become a disciple of Jesus Christ. They don't want to do that. They want to go to a school instead because they're carnal. They don't have the word of God abiding in them. They want to go to a school instead and pay the money and get a piece of paper that says that they are this or that. And that piece of paper is worth absolutely nothing in the presence of God or in the presence of any Christian. Just here to my right, I have a printer. I could print up a, a document that says that I have a, a doctorate of divinity if I wanted to. It would cost me about four cents. And that's what it would be worth. So there are men and women that instead of seeking God and being raised up by God, because the Bible says, all thy children shall be taught of the Lord. You see, the Bible says that those, are, those that belong to God are born of God. They're not born of the flesh, nor of blood, nor of the will of man, but of God. You see, and how are people born of God? By a seed. Just like everything that is born is born of a seed. And in this particular case, the seed is the word of God. Jesus said this in the parable of the sower. It's written in Luke chapter 8, verse 11. Jesus said, now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. And this is why Jesus said to the Pharisees that they couldn't understand his words because they were not of his sheep and they didn't have his father's word abiding in them. You see, the Pharisees knew the scripture. They knew the scripture backwards and forwards. But they did not have God's word abiding in them. They didn't have the seed in them. Therefore, they didn't have the life. Because the Bible says, in him was life. And the life was the light of men. So it is very, very important. In fact, it is a matter of life and death. That we do what God said in order to obtain eternal life. Because Jesus said when he was praying to God, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. You see, this is life eternal, to know the only true God and his son Jesus Christ, whom he sent. That's eternal life. And my friends and brethren, there are many, 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 many people in this world. So I say many, 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 many people in this world who falsely believe that they are Christians, but they do not believe the doctrine of Christ. And this is why Paul said to Timothy, who was a bishop under his ministry, he said, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. What does take heed mean? It means be careful, have a care, be wary of what's going on around you, guard these things. See, that's what take heed means. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. So why have I said all this? I'm, I'm leading up to something and I want to talk to you about a specific organization that exists in Charlotte, North Carolina. And the pastor of this organization, whose name is Matthew... Pardon me just for a moment. Matthew Furtick. No, pardon me. His name is Stephen Furtick. I'm sorry, I had that mixed up in my mind. His name is Stephen Furtick. They call him Pastor Stephen Furtick. And the reason that I'm making this video is not to speak against Stephen as if he were some sort of bad man or as if I hated him or something or as if he had done anything to me, because he certainly hasn't. I've never met him. I don't know him. But I'm making this video because of a request of a young brother who was, it was pressed upon his heart greatly to ask me that I would make a public video about this organization for the purpose of showing that this organization is not Christian. It is not abiding in the doctrine of Christ. It's, a, it's an organization called Elevation Church, and it's located in Charlotte, North Carolina. And the pastor's name is Stephen Furtick, and his wife's name is Holly. And I'm sure that they're very nice people. I shouldn't say I'm sure, never met them, but I'm reasonably sure that they're very nice people, and I have nothing to speak against them as people. I'm not here to, to speak against them or to revile them or to speak evil of them or accuse them falsely of anything or anything like that. They may be very nice people, but that's really beside the point. The point is that this particular organization, this, this organization called Elevation Church, 
is a religious entertainment center for sinners. And there are lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of people who are going to this church, not only in Charlotte, North Carolina, but in other places as well, because there's many different um, buildings associated with that organization. And they're going into that church and they're learning lies. They're being deceived because this man, Pastor Stephen Furtick, is not abiding in the doctrine of Christ. And the Bible says that whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. The phrase hath not God means does not have God. So you see, even though a lot of people go to churches like this and they're really emotional and they might praise and sing and even cry and they might pray and even their prayers might get answered. And so they're deceived into thinking because of all these things that they're Christians when they have not done what Jesus said to do, which is to continue in his word and be his disciple. His word is here. His word is not found in Elevation Church. It's not found in any church that has a building that's called a church and that has a title other than the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, because Jesus Christ only has one church, and that's the church that's called by his name. Because the church is his bride, just like any man's bride is called by his name. So it is that the bride of Jesus Christ is called by his name. You see, so Jesus Christ doesn't have any church that's called Catholic or Protestant or Lutheran or Baptist or Mormon or Jehovah's Witness or Pentecostal or Apostolic or Church of God in Christ or African Methodist Episcopal or Episcopalian or, or Presbyterian or, or, or any of the other hundreds of man-made organizations that are out there that call themselves Christians, but they, they are called by other names than Jesus Christ. You see? My wife is called by my name because she's my wife. She belongs to me. She's my property. She's part of my body. She pertains to my house. And so she's called by my name. And so it is with the bride of Jesus Christ. His church is his property. She has been bought with his blood, and she is called by his name. She's not called by any other name. And she doesn't build buildings and call them churches because Jesus never commanded her to do so. And she doesn't go to seminaries because Jesus never commanded her to do so. And so what happens when a person goes to a seminary? They become very confused. So this man, um, who is called Pastor Stephen Furtick, I'm, I'm on the website right now, the elevationchurch.org, and the page that's called Leadership. And we can see on this page, he has a very nice picture of him and his wife there, and they're, they're a handsome couple. Um... But it says in this little, this little paragraph many things about him. One of the things that it says about him is he holds a Master of Divinity degree from Southern Theological Seminary. So by this, those of us who are Christians can know immediately that this man cannot possibly be in the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because Christians don't go to seminary, and there is no such thing as a seminary that teaches the truth about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Seminaries are Jesuit institutions which are given to us by Rome, because we're living in the Roman Empire. If you doubt that, just go to the Vatican and look and see who's sitting on the throne. It's the emperor. He's called the Pope. He's the one who rules the world. He's the king of the world under the leadership of Satan. The Pope, he's the emperor. Roman emperors began to be called popes about 1,700 years ago. But they're still the Roman emperors. The Roman, em the Roman Empire did not fall. It merely went into the shadows. And now there's presented to the world a, a curtain which looks like democracy. But it's still the Roman Empire. And the Bible testifies of this. But I won't go into all that right now. But there is no such thing, there can be no such thing, as a master of divinity. Now just ask Job. Ask Job if there's any such thing as a master of divinity Job was a very wise and blessed man, and he spoke some things unadvisedly. And when he did, God Almighty reproved him of it, and Job abhorred himself in dust and ashes. Because God said to him, Who is this that speaketh words without knowledge? You see, there is no one that can possibly have a master of divinity. Such a, such a notion is completely ridiculous. A master of divinity. See, d the divinity is God. The divinity is God. That's what the word divinity means. It means God. 
The word Godhead in the scripture is translated from the Greek word, which means the divinity. You see? So there is no one who can possibly have a master of divinity. And anybody who professes to have that, and they have a piece of paper on their wall that came from some Jesuit seminary that says that they have a master of divinity or a doctorate of divinity, you can instantly know that that person doesn't have a clue who Jesus Christ is and that that person is certainly not in the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the case with this particular person. Again, I don't know Stephen. He might be a very nice man. Him and his wife, they might be very nice people. And if we were neighbors, they might be very nice neighbors. I don't know. Maybe they would come over and borrow a cup of sugar. I don't know. But the point of this message, because I am a man of God, is to show you from the scripture that these people are not in the doctrine of Christ. So I'm going to go to another page on the, on the website. It's the elevationchurch.org website. And this is the page that is called Beliefs. Beliefs. The very first paragraph here is titled The Bible, and it says the Bible is God's word to all people. It was written by human authors under the supernatural guidance of the Holy Spirit. Because it was inspired by God, the Bible is truth without any mixture of error and is completely relevant to our daily lives. Well, that's a true statement. Praise the Lord. Now, I don't know what goes on in this man's church or this man's churches if they read from the King James Bible or if they read from other Bibles. I don't know that. I, I, I haven't done a whole lot of research about this man. I've spent um, a couple of, well, I've spent a couple of times praying about this situation since I received this email from this young brother. And I've also spent this evening maybe a half an hour looking into this man and uh, a couple of his videos and listening to how he speaks and also his wife and listening to how she speaks and going through the website. So I don't know what Bible they they use, um, but if they're not using the King James Bible, then they're not using the Word of God. They're using another Bible which is translated incorrectly on purpose. And the other Bibles that are translated incorrectly on purpose are done so to facilitate the teaching of false doctrines that are not the Word of God. That's why those Bibles are worded differently. It's not to make them easier to understand, and it's not because they were translated from older and more reliable manuscripts. Whenever you see that phrase, older and more reliable manuscripts, you know that that's a lie. Because if you want to know what was written in the original Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic texts, then here it is. It's been translated for us into English perfectly by providence, by the divine hand of God, a little over 400 years ago. Here it is right here. If you want to know what's in the Hebrew and Greek, here it is right here. It's translated for us into English. So you don't need to know Hebrew and Greek, and you don't need to buy all those new... Or pardon me, all those New Age Bibles um, to, um, to, to twist up the Word of God and tell you things that are not true. Like I said in the beginning of this video, if your Bible says one thing and my Bible says another thing, both of our Bibles are in the same language, but they're not saying the same thing, then they can't possibly both be God's Word. Because how can they both be God's Word if they're not profitable for doctrine? If your Bible says something different than my Bible, how can it be profitable for doctrine? Doctrine is teaching. Or how can it be profitable for correction if your Bible says something different than what my Bible says? You know, if my Bible says fornication, but your Bible says sexual immorality, well, then one of our Bibles is not the Word of God, because sexual immorality is not written in the Scripture anywhere. You see, it's an ambiguous phrase that could mean many things to many people. But fornication is a definite term that means what it means and says what it says. And that's why in the Holy Bible, the Bible uses the word fornication, because that's what Jesus said. It's translated from a Greek word pornea, and that's what it means. Fornication. It doesn't mean sexual immorality. It means fornication. That's just one example. But the Bible says what it says on purpose, and for anyone to take it and change it around, and then sell it to people as if it were easier to read or translated from older or more reliable manuscripts, that's deception, and they're translated wrong on purpose in order to lead people astray. So I don't know what goes on in, in Mr. Furtick's church. I don't know. But the King James Bible is the word of God for those of us who speak English. So his statement about the Bible is true. Um, I just don't know what Bible he reads from. So let's go on. This is the next one I want to talk to you about, and this is probably the last one I'm going to talk to you about because I don't need to go on and on and on in this video, and I know that a lot of people don't have a long uh, attention span and want to watch a, an hour-long video, so I'm going to try to, to keep this short. So this next passage in his in, on his beliefs page is 
titled Trinity. Trinity, it says, God has existed in relationship with himself for all eternity. He exists as one substance in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Although each member of the Trinity serves different functions, they each possess equal power and authority. Now, my friends, my neighbors, my brethren, as a Christian minister, having read this Holy Bible many times, all the way through many times, and being called of God to teach His Word, as a teacher and a minister and a prophet to the nations, I declare unto you that there is not one single word in all of this Holy Bible that says anything about anything that I just read to you from this paragraph. What I just read to you from this paragraph on Mr. Fertig's website is complete mythology. It's a lie. It has absolutely nothing to do with the living God. The Bible says that God is one. The Bible says that there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself to be, um, to be, uh, who gave himself as a ransom for all, to be testified in due time. Praise the Lord. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. The Bible says of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, that in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The Godhead is God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember I told you a few minutes ago that the Godhead means the divinity? That's what it means. The deity, the divinity, the godness, the godhood, the godity. If I can make up some words just to describe to you exactly what the word Godhead means. The word Godhead doesn't mean a trinity. The word Godhead doesn't mean three anything. The word Godhead is singular. It's a singular noun. It means the divinity. and It's a word that refers to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word Godhead is used three times in the scripture, and in each time it's referring to the same thing. God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Almighty God, the Maker of all things. He is the Godhead. And the Bible says in Colossians 2.9 that in Christ Jesus, the Son of God, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's the mystery of godliness, according to 1 Timothy 3.16. God was manifest in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, 2 Corinthians 5.19. You see, the scripture says all throughout that there is one God and that that God is a spirit and he is holy. That's why he's called the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that when Mary was pregnant, that that which was conceived in her was of the Holy Ghost. So we know from the scripture that the Holy Ghost is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, there's only one Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit and Holy Ghost are interchangeable terms. They mean the same thing. There's only one Holy Spirit, and that's God. God is holy, and God is a spirit. So the Holy Spirit is God. He's not a third person of a trinity of gods. He is God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, when Jesus was filled with the Holy Ghost, what did he call the Holy Ghost that was in him? The Father. He called him the Father. Why? Because that's what he is. See, the Holy Ghost is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is called Jesus because that's his Father's name. And his Father is the Holy Ghost. You see, so the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost is Jesus. Jesus is a word that means Jehovah the Savior. Actually, I should say it this way. Jesus is a name that means Jehovah the Savior. More literally translated, it means the one which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. And this is written many times throughout the book of the Revelation. Why? Because it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. You see? By the way, thanks for knowing that it's not Revelations. There's no book in the Bible called Revelations. It's the revelation. It's one, the revelation of Jesus Christ. In fact, those are the first words of the book, the revelation of Jesus Christ. See, it's not the revelation of John. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus' name is written all throughout that book, the one which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. You see, when you see the Son of God, you're looking at the Father who sent him because the Father who sent him is in him. That's why Jesus said, I am in my Father and the Father in me. That's why Jesus said, I and my Father are one. Because God was in Christ. You see, so there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. This is what the Bible teaches. 
But let's read this paragraph from this man, Mr. Furtick, again. He says, God has existed in relationship with himself for all eternity. That's blasphemy. This man is accusing God of being schizophrenic. God has never existed in relationship with himself. That's ridiculous. That is a symptom of mental illness. That's not an, an, an attribute of God. See, God is eternal, yes. But he hasn't existed in relationship with himself. How can he have a relationship with himself? He is one. You see? But this man says God has existed in relationship with himself for all eternity. He exists as one substance in three persons. That's completely ridiculous. I know that it's very popular. I know that this is taught in just about every Catholic and Protestant church that you may, may have ever even heard of. I know that. But it's ridiculous, and it's a lie. It's mythology, and it comes from Babylon. You see, that's why the Bible talks to us so much about Babylon, coming out of Babylon. Babylon isn't some ancient city that hasn't, has no effect on us anymore. Babylon is that same system that came from that ancient city where Nimrod was the king. You see, Babylon is that which has caused all the kings of the earth to be drunken with the wine of her fornication. This is written of in the book of the Revelation. You see, Babylon is that great city who ruleth over all the kings of the earth. Like I just showed you a few minutes ago, if you want to know where the emperor is, go to Vatican City. Where's Vatican City? It's a country that exists in the city of Rome. Vatican City, it's a country that exists. It's a nation state, a sovereign nation state that has nothing to do with Italy. And it exists in the city of Rome, within the limits of the city of Rome. You see, just like the city of London Corporation is a country and it exists in a city which is also called the city of London. And just like Washington, the District of Columbia is a country. It's a foreign country to the United States. It's a country, it's a sovereign nation state that exists on 10 square miles of land in the United States of America on United States land, you see, but it's not the United States. It's not one of the 50 states. The District of Columbia is not one of the 50 states. It's the District of Columbia. It's a foreign country, you see. So you have the Vatican, and you have the City of London Corporation, and you also have the Washington, D.C. Corporation, or the United States of America Corporation, which exists in the District of Columbia. All these three are countries they're sovereign nation states that have nothing to do with the countries in which they reside, except that they dwell upon the land that belongs to those countries. You see? And so I digress. I don't want to go into that, but um, I could go into that in more detail. If you want to know more about that, ask me, and I'll be happy to send you a link to a video where I've gone into that in more, much more detail. But the, the phrase, he exists as one substance in three persons, is completely a fable. There's, an, there's absolutely not one word of the scripture that says anything about God existing in three persons. There's no word of the scripture that says God is a, a substance, one substance, or three persons. There's absolutely nothing in the Bible that says or suggests anything like that. And so, just like all of the lies that Rome will tell you, when she, when she tells you one of her lies... She will take words from the Bible here and there and put them into her lies to make you think that those things are from the Bible. So, I mean, she does it with the Christmas festival. She does it with the Easter festival. She does it with the gospel. She does it with, you know, the, the confession. She does it with all the aspects of, you know, the Catholic Church and the Protestant churches and all the pagan traditions that are, that are practiced and taught by those organizations. She'll take, she'll, she'll make a, 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 pardon me, she'll take a complete lie that was given to us from Babylon, and then she'll just inject words from the Bible here and there to make it sound like it's from the Bible. That's what originally happened when the Catholic Church was created in the 4th century under Constantine. It's the Roman religion. It's the religion of the Romans. But Constantine made a decree for political reasons saying that Christianity is now going to be the official religion of the Roman Empire. But it had nothing to do with being a Christian. It was something that, that, that Constantine and his government did to take the Roman religion and paste names from the Bible onto the idols that the Romans were worshipping to make it seem like it was Christianity. 
See, so they used to worship Saturn and Jupiter and Mars and Mercury and Venus and all the, 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 the Roman gods. You see, that's why all the planets are called by those names because they're named after the Roman gods. So they used to worship all those Roman gods. But then after Constantine made that decree, they still kept worshiping all those Roman gods, but they called them di by different names instead. They called them Mary and baby Jesus and St. Peter and St. Paul and St. Jude and so on and so forth. See, but it's still the Roman religion. They're still worshiping devils. But they don't know it. Because why? They haven't read the Bible. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John, 8, John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. You see, but people won't do that. They just go to church instead. And they imagine because their, their pastors who graduated from seminaries are lying to them and telling them the lies that they learn in these Jesuit seminaries. They imagine that the act of going to church is pleasing to God. And they imagine that because their pastor supposedly knows the Bible that they don't have to. So they just sit there and they listen to all the stuff that their pastor tells them. And, and it sounds like it could be from the Bible. So they just say, okay, well, my pastor preaches straight out of the Bible and he must be telling the truth. And they totally neglect to do the one thing that God commanded them to do, which is to read the Bible for themselves. You see, if they would read the Bible for themselves, they wouldn't be going to a church and they wouldn't be sitting under the ministry of a man who is teaching them that God has existed in, relation with, in relationship with himself for all eternity. He exists as one substance in three persons. And then he takes the words Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from the Bible and he pastes it into this lie about some God that supposedly exists as one substance in three persons. You see, but that's a lie. Did you know that the only time that the words Father, Son, and Holy Ghost appear in the Bible in the same sentence is only one time. It's in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, where Jesus had been risen from the dead and he was instructing his disciples on how to preach the gospel of the New Testament. And so he told them, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And then he ascended into heaven right in front of them. And ten days later, the Holy Ghost was poured out and the New Testament began and they began to preach, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all those that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That's the promise. And that's when the gospel of the New Testament began to be preached by Peter and all the rest of the apostles. You see? So Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. You see, Jesus wasn't talking about three persons. He was talking about one name, his name. Why did he say it the way he did, Brother Clinton? He said it the way that he did because his word is a stumbling block to the wicked and it is life to the righteous. You see, to the disobedient, God's word is a sealed book. And you cannot understand it if you're disobedient. Even as it's written in James 1.22, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. You see, if you're a hearer of the word of God, but not a doer of the word of God, then you're deceiving your own self. It's not God deceiving you because he gets some sort of jollies off of deceiving people. It's that God has ordained his word in such a way that those who will, who will not obey it will not understand it. But those who with humble hearts who will just bow down before him and obey his word, they will understand. They will have the light of life. That's why it's written, In thy light shall we see light. It's written in the Psalms. Praise the Lord. See, so Jesus wasn't talking about three persons when he said Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He was talking about a name. One name. He said, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. That name is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the name of the Son of God because that's his Father's name. It means Jehovah the Savior. 
That's his father's name. That's why his son's name is Jesus Christ. And of course, his father is the Holy Ghost. He's holy and he's a spirit. Therefore, he is the Holy Spirit. You see, so there's no three persons. This man took a few words out of the Bible and injected it into a lie and teaches this lie to the people in his congregation so that they imagine that God is a trinity of persons. And why is he teaching them to imagine that God is a trinity of persons? So that he can baptize them with a false baptism and tell them that baptism doesn't save you, which is a lie. According to the Bible, that's a lie. And also, he puts them in the water and he says, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And he just dunks them under the water and doesn't say the name. So he's not baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's a lie. See, he says he's going to baptize them in a name, but then he doesn't baptize them in a name. He baptizes them with no name. So that's a lie. So these are two lies that he tells to people when he baptizes them. Therefore, they're not baptized into Jesus Christ. They're not Christians. They're not in the faith of Jesus Christ because they don't know who Jesus Christ is. They think that Jesus Christ is a third part of a trinity of gods. That he is the second person of the trinity. And the other two persons of the trinity are not called Jesus Christ. That's what the, these people believe who are under the ministry of this lying man who professes to have a master of divinity. Which is, again, completely ridiculous. No man can ever possibly have a master of divinity. And for any man to think that he does is the pinnacle of arrogance. Period. That's why these wicked people in the Roman Catholic and Protestant churches who go to these seminaries like it when people call them reverend. What does reverend mean? Have you ever asked yourself that? Why, why do they call themselves reverend or ask people to call them reverend? Reverend is a word to, that means to be revered to be feared as God, to be worshipped as God. You see, the, 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 the Roman Caesars, they called themselves Augustus. Have you ever heard of Augustus Caesar? Well, Augustus isn't a name, it's a title. Augustus means reverend. That's where the word reverend comes from. It comes from the Latin word Augustus. That's why one of the months of the year is called August, because it comes from that word, Augustus. See, the Roman emperors believe that they are gods. They're Satanists. They worship devils. They drink blood. You see, the popes are Roman emperors. All throughout the, the history of Roman emperors, they're Satanists. And that's why they like it when people call them reverend, because they like to be worshipped. They're psychopaths. They think that they are gods, because they're indwelt by devils. And the devils are the gods, the fallen angels, and their offspring. Those are the gods. Every, every uh, pagan nation with every pagan religion that you see in the whole world where they have their gods that's where those gods came from they didn't just get imagined they didn't just get dreamed up someday when you know two guys were sitting by a bonfire drinking coffee and invented the gods nay the gods are reality they are the fallen angels and their offspring which were giants and they're still worshiped today in the catholic and protestant churches when people worship a trinity of gods that's what they're worshiping you see because the bible says that that which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice unto devils and not to God. You see? So you cannot sit at the table of devils and at the table of Jesus Christ. You have to make up your mind. And that's why we started this, this lesson in 1 Timothy chapter 4. And let's go back there again. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. Paul wrote to Timothy, and he said, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. So if we do that, if we do what Paul instructed by the Holy Ghost, then we abide in the word of God, we take heed unto ourselves, and we take heed unto the doctrine. What doctrine? The doctrine of Christ, the doctrine that is taught in the Bible. The Bible. And so that way, when we know the doctrine that is taught in the Bible, by doing what, boys and girls? By reading it every day, by abiding in it every day, then we know the truth. And when we know the truth, then we immediately recognize a lie. And so when we, when we read or hear something like this, God has existed in relationship with himself for all eternity. He exists as one substance in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Although each member of the Trinity, each member of the Trinity, serves different functions 
they each possess equal power and authority. Well, that's a really nice story and everything, but it's ridiculous and it's an absolute myth and it has absolutely nothing to do with anything that's written in the Holy Bible. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is not a member of the Trinity. The Bible says that in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You see, Jesus Christ is not a member of the Godhead. The Godhead is in Jesus Christ. That's what the scripture says. You see, Rome will tell you that Jesus Christ is a member of the Godhead. But God says that the Godhead is in Jesus Christ. So now we have a choice. Are we going to believe the lies from Rome? Or are we going to believe the word of God? Blessed be the name of the Lord. So those who, are, who have been confused about these things in time past, I hope that this has been a blessing to you. Again, I did not make this video to revile Mr. Furtick or his wife. They're, they're, they may be very nice people, and I have nothing evil to say about them as people at all. But what I have set forth in this video message is the truth. And it is the difference, the very clear difference, between what the Bible says, which is the doctrine of Christ, and what Mr. Furtick says and preaches. So Mr. Furtick is what I refer to as a motivational speaker. He and his wife, Holly, they're motivational speakers. See, there's motivational speakers that do infomercials, that, that sell garden products, and that sell workout products, and that sell various things. Well, these two people are the same thing. It's just that they have chosen to use the name of Jesus Christ to, um, to, to entertain people with their, with their, with their, their talents. Okay, they're motivational speaking, and they make a lot of money. Okay, now is it a, is it a crime to make a lot of money? No, it isn't. But is it a crime to make a lot of money by deceiving people? Yes, it is. And is it is it a crime to make a lot of money by deceiving people by using the name of Jesus Christ? Yes, so much the more. And so when this man Stephen Furtick and his wife Holly stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, if they don't turn from their wicked ways and stop doing what they're doing. They're going to be in terrible trouble. And so will you be if you keep following their leadership because they are leading you into the ditch. They don't know who Jesus Christ is. They've never preached the gospel of Jesus Christ or the way of salvation in Jesus Christ to anybody ever. They're professional religious entertainers. That's what they are. See, if Stephen Furtick was a Christian, he would preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. He wouldn't be preaching the lies of Rome. He wouldn't be proclaiming a trinity of gods, a God that has supposedly existed in relationship with himself for all eternity. That's blasphemy. That's ridiculous. That's, 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 that's describing God as having a mental illness. It's, but that's a complete and total lie. See, if, if this man Stephen Furtick were a Christian, he would not allow his wife to be speaking in the church. He wouldn't allow his wife to be wearing men's clothes or to have her face all painted. He wouldn't allow her to be doing the things that she's doing. You see, if he were a Christian pastor, then his wife would be doing what a pastor's wife does. For those of you who may not know this, what does a pastor's wife do? She serves her husband in his house. That's what she does. A pastor's wife, the role of a pastor's wife is not to be a pastorette, to pretend to be a pastor too. A pastor's wife is to stay home and serve her husband. And she is to be silent in the church. She is not to teach or usurp authority over men, but to be in silence, to learn in silence with all subjection. This is what the Bible says about a woman, a Christian woman, and especially the pastor's wife, because a pastor's wife ought to be an example to the rest of the wives in the congregation. But Holly Furtick is an example of wickedness in Jezebel. And, you know, everything that she does is everything that that the Bible says that a woman shouldn't do. And if Stephen Furtick were a Christian, then he would not allow her to do those things. You see, he would have taught her the truth, and she would be in his house, serving him in his house. And nobody would know her name except those that are close to them, uh, because nobody needs to know her name. You know, I have a wife. She's, she's my wife. She's not a pastorette. She's not a prophetess. She's my wife, and she lives with me in my house, and she serves me, and, 
Everybody out there who might have heard the word of God by my mouth doesn't need to know who my wife is. That's irrelevant to them. It doesn't matter to them. She's my servant. She's here to serve me in my house. I love her and she loves me. We have a blood covenant together in God, in marriage. And she's my wife. She serves me in my house. It's none of anybody's business out there who my wife is, except those whom I have a, a relationship, a friendship with. You know, they're, those that are close to me and they've been to my house and they know me personally, then they know my wife. See, but it's not necessary for everybody on YouTube to know who my wife is. You see, that's, that's not relevant. What is relevant is the word of God that comes forth from my mouth. You see, because the fullness of the Godhead is in me. And I preach to you the words of the living God. That's my vocation from the Lord. I See, I'm not here to earn a living. I'm not here to make money. I'm not here to beg you for money. I'm not here to say we need a bigger temple and a bigger parking lot. I'm not here to say that it costs me money to preach the gospel. Because you know what? It doesn't. It doesn't cost me money to preach the gospel. Okay? Well, my internet bill is about $50 a month. But, you know, other than that, it doesn't cost me... And I don't need internet to preach the gospel. There's a lot of people outside my neighborhood. I could preach the gospel without internet, too. You see? So it doesn't cost me any money to preach the gospel, and I'm not here to ask anybody for money ever. Do I live by the tithes and offerings of the saints? Yes, I do. God has ordained that, and I do. But I don't ask anybody for money. That, that's not involved in any of the, the messages on, on, this, on this channel, on this ministry. You'll never find a video of Brother Clinton saying, Friends and brethren, I need more funds to do this or that. That's one thing that you'll never ever find here. Praise the Lord, because that's not what I'm here to do. I'm called of God, and I'm here to give you the word of God. You see, my payment will be given to me when I get home. And in the meantime, the Lord, my God, he provides for me all that I have need of by means of the saints. See, but I don't ask anybody uh, when I have need of something except my father. If I have need of something, I ask my father, and he will provide it for me if I need it. And if I don't need it, then he won't provide it for me. You see, but that's why I'm here. A man of God doesn't ask for money. A man of God doesn't say that he has a master of divinity. A man of God will never ask or allow anyone to call him reverend this or that, or pastor this and that, or apostle this and that. Men of God don't do that. See? Men of God don't flaunt their wives in the church and tell their wives to put on men's clothes and go be a pastorette and have this little, you know, have her own church and stand on a stage with a microphone and, and act like she's called to preach the word of God and teach the word of God. You see, men of God don't allow their wives to do that, and women of God would never essay to do that anyway. You see, but this man, Stephen Furtick, and his wife, Holly, they're professional religious entertainers. They're motivational speakers, like Kenneth and Gloria Copeland. You know, it's, it's the same thing. They're motivational speakers. They speak well, they have a talent for deceiving people, and they make a lot of money. That's what's going on in Elevation Church. May this message be a blessing to all those who have ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen.